Another day, another deposition. As House Democrats ratchet up the pace of the impeachment inquiry, lining up a steady stream of witnesses with knowledge of the Trump administration's dealings with Ukraine. Today was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State George Kent, who sent an email to colleagues last year expressing concern over the firing of the ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, calling her the target of a, quote, classic disinformation campaign. But Ken's testimony follows two blockbuster depositions over the long weekend, first with Yovanovitch herself, who Trump bragged about firing on the now infamous phone call with the president of Ukraine. She told lawmakers Friday she doesn't know why Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, pushed for her firing, but added, quote, individuals who have been named in the press as contacts of Mr. Giuliani may well have believed that their personal financial ambitions were stymied by our anti-corruption policy in Ukraine. Then there was Fiona Hill. She's the former top Trump White House advisor on Russia. In a 10-hour deposition yesterday, she told lawmakers that concerns about the administration's effort to push Ukraine for political dirt had made it all the way up to former National Security Advisor John Bolton. And Hill says Bolton told her that, quote, Giuliani's a hand grenade who's going to blow everybody up. Their testimony came as the news broke that Giuliani is now under federal investigation by prosecutors in New York. Democrats say it's all building up to a case for impeachment, but to Republicans, it's the process that's the problem. If Democrats really are trying to build a legitimate case, they would use legitimate tools. They would hold a vote on the House floor to establish procedures, but uh, we continue to see this as the sham and the charade that it is. When witnesses actually just show up, it advances our investigation. The arrows continue to point in just one direction. Joining me are Jennifer Braceres, columnist and senior fellow with the Independent Women's Forum. Hi, Jennifer. Good to Hi. see you. And Nancy Gertner, retired federal judge and senior lecturer at Harvard Law. Judge Gertner, it's good to see you. You know, we haven't addressed on the show at all some of the criticism directed at the impeachment process itself. So I'm going to give it a try for a few minutes with a couple of crack lawyers. In a White House counsel's letter... Uh, the counsel said to the uh, uh, intelligence, I guess the Judiciary Committee, there's never been an impeachment inquiry without a majority of the House voting for it. It is not constitutionally required. That is clear. Okay. But as a matter of fundamental fairness, which is sort of your whole My life deal. story, right. <laughs> wouldn't it make sense for the Democrats to do this even if they're not required to? Um, if that's a political question. I think that what Pelosi said initially, I think that why she's not doing this is that she doesn't, Voting for the impeachment inquiry will be tantamount to voting for impeachment for some people in the in the House. And I think that she's trying to keep them from having to sign on the dotted line. I don't agree that it's only a political matter. I don't mean that it's legally precedential, right. but it is precedential in a de facto sort of way. If it turns out the tradition in the House of Representatives when it's doing an impeachment is there's a majority vote, then it's a lot harder not to have a majority vote going forward. I, I don't think, I mean, the House has a constitutional right to make its own rules. Um, so I, I don't think it matters. I mean, in other words, what Pelosi has said is de facto an impeachment inquiry. They're going ahead with it. I don't think it matters. Does it matter? I, actually, I agree with both of you. I mean, the House has a right to make its own rules. That's clear. Mm -hmm. But from a political standpoint, you would think that it would be more transparent to just hold the vote. However, they did it with Clinton and Nixon, by the way, right. both cases. They right. didn't have to, but they right. did. The problem is, I don't think that that most members of the House, certainly members from either party in swing districts, don't want to have to go on record. OK, right. so this one is more, I think you'll both agree, legal than political. And a statement of the head of the RNC, who I think is Mitt Romney's niece or some such thing, uh, uh, <laughs> says that uh, the precedent's being ignored, that the president should be allowed to call witnesses and the minority party should be allowed, should have subpoena power. Again, not constitutionally required. Right. But should it happen? Look, I mean, if Nancy Pelosi were to use the, the Nixon or Clinton playbook and just say, yes, I'm doing everything the way it was done in the past, that would look better for her, right? That would give the American people some sense that there was protocol and fairness and, and process. So I, I don't understand why she won't do that. I'm sort of with her. I mean, again, in both Clinton and Nixon, as I think Jennifer was suggesting, White House counsel allowed to testify. Uh, in front of the House hearings uh, mm -hmm. in the Clinton situation, and uh, uh, rebuttal evidence was allowed to be you know, provided by Nixon's supporters. 
in his impeachment but, you proceeding. know, I mean, it's a ruse. It doesn't matter what the House did, what kind of process, even if it was, you know, the most blue ribbon ever, there would still be these criticisms. And so I well, think why Pelosi... Not avoid, why not avoid the criticism? Well, and why I, not show I, the American I, people that you believe in fundamental fairness? But I think that all this is going to, is going to be released. I think they wanted to make a case is outside... They? They, I think Pelosi wanted okay. the case to be made, you know, sort of outside of... This incredible grandstanding by House, you know, representatives. They wanted to make it in sort of a very legal, lawyerly like way. Then they'll release the depositions, I, and then they'll. But I'll tell you, as an American citizen, if I'm sitting at home and I hear the majority party doesn't have to allow you to provide rebuttal evidence, but in the spirit of, of spirit of fairness, they are going to let you do it. They don't have to allow you to do X, but they will because they want to bend over backwards. Don't you think that creates a different feel with the American yes, people yeah, who is polarized as Congress? I, you don't care about no, that. No, well, it, it's not that. It's just that we've seen what has happened to public hearings, and we've seen the way they have been overtaken by both sides and, and how ridiculous they've become. I like the idea of there being 10-hour depositions where people are just asking meaningful questions. I think they should release those transcripts, and then I think that they, then there could be hearings, but at least get the bedrocks under outside of the zoo that is American politics. I, I think the Democrats aren't doing themselves any favors with how they're handling it for precisely the reasons you said. Okay, this one is my third and final attempt at a legal question about process. <laughs> Mitch McConnell didn't hold a hearing in the Merrick Garland mm. nomination. But he appears to feel he has a different obligation here. Here is the Senate uh, Republican leader on CNBC on September 30th on how he would handle impeachment if it makes its way to the Senate. I would have no choice but to take it up. Uh, how long you're on it is a whole different matter. So he believes he has a constitutional obligation if there's an impeachment vote in the House to hold a trial. But when you read other comments from him, he says, OK, we allow opening statements and then a motion to dismiss. We'll vote. We'll, a majority will support the motion to dismiss. It'll be over like that. Is he on firm footing there? Yes. Why wouldn't he be? I mean, well, why even allow opening statements then? Why not a motion to because, dismiss? Because he believes he rightly that he that he has to. And the Republicans control the Senate. And so therefore, they hold the power and can vote once they open the, the inquiry, the trial, they can vote how they want Why to. does he have to allow opening statements? Why doesn't he just open the trial and allow for a motion to dismiss? Uh, be, well, because, because the, if there's one thing that the Constitution provides for with respect to this, is that the Senate proceeding looks like a trial. Roberts is the judge, you know, is, over, is overseeing the Chief it. Justice, right, yes. is overseeing it, right. Um, and, and, you know, it has to be a trial-like proceeding. To be sure, in a trial, there could be a motion to dismiss, but there has to be a trial-like proceeding. That is, in fact, in the Constitution. Okay, how about the content. Uh, Democrats say we do not need a quid pro quo. The mere fact that the President of the United States on the infamous phone call with Ukraine asked for a foreign government essentially to interfere in an election right. is it's a violation of law and an impeachable offense under the Constitution. Do they need a quid pro quo? No. There are, two, there, are two character, there are two laws involved here. Um, first, to the extent that impeachment is, is, involves an issue of crime, which it doesn't necessarily. It's a political decision. But there really are Bribery, two concepts. Bribery, treason, high crimes, one, and misdemeanors. But one concept is essentially violating the election laws by soliciting foreign, mm -hmm. uh, you know, foreign help in an election for your side. The quid pro quo would be extortion. If they said, and I actually think there's other evidence of it, we're not going to give you an audience with the president. We're not going to give you the military aid unless you do X. That's actually extortion. Either way, they're impeachable. But you don't offenses. think it's necessary. Do you think a quid pro quo is necessary? I think impeachment is a political um, process. It's not a legal process in that sense. They can impeach for abuse of power, and they can define that as... Well, as Gerald Ford, when he's a member of the House, said impeachment exactly. is whatever we say right. it is. You know, I agree right. with her. Okay. And can I right. agree with her. You I know, want to stop now. One of the incredible <laughs> moments here was on uh, October 4th, the president was asked on the lawn about the text from the EU ambassador, ambassador of the EU, Gordon Sondland, who's going to set to testify on Thursday. Here's what the president of the United States had to say. The text message that I saw from Ambassador Sondland, who's highly respected, was there's no quid pro quo. He said, by the way, there's no quid pro quo. There is no pro quo. And that was the text message that I saw. And that nullified everything. That was the text message she saw. And according to the Washington Post, whether you needed a, a quid pro quo or not, Gordon Sondland is going to testify on Thursday. I don't know if there was a quid pro quo. I called the president. He told me to say there was no quid right. pro quo. So right. the only thing I can say with certainty is he said 
there was no quid pro quo. Right. What are Republicans who not only say there has to be a quid pro quo, but have hung their hat on Gordon Sunland's text? What do they do if Sunland does what the Washington Post says they're going to do and comes in and says, I wrote what the president told me to write, just like Donald Trump Jr. said what the president told him to say on Air Force One about the meeting in Trump Tower. What do the Republicans do then? They pull out the witch hunt card. I don't know. <laughs> They do. But it totally, I mean, yeah, you, yeah. Are, you agree with me that that's been their primary calling card here, yeah. is Sunland proves there was a quid pro quo, and apparently... Yeah, but it does, also it doesn't matter what was said on the call. The the, uh, the circumstances which the, the Democrats are developing suggest there was a quid pro quo. In other words, it doesn't have to have been on the July 25th call. It reminds me of the drug dealers that I represented who said that if they didn't say marijuana on the phone, that somehow you couldn't go after them. And I think that's what this sounds like. We should be clear, you didn't represent them when you were a judge. Not when you I was a judge. Them prior. That's right. That's right. Your last thing is <laughs> Lindsey Graham uh, today is uh, was answering a reporter's question. Here's the question and Graham Republicans response. Here it is. So 20 years ago, you said that not uh, complying with the subpoena was an impeachable yeah, I'm, offense. I'm, I'm, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. I was, sort of did a double take when he uh, did that. He's been a pretty big defender of the president, at least from the moment that John McCain died. He's been a big uh, defender of the president. One, is he right? And I guess you would say the answer is yes, because it is whatever they say it is. Does that indicate to you that there's a crack in Lindsey Graham's support of the president? I think there's a crack in Republican support for the president for a lot of reasons, some of which have nothing to do with impeachment. Syria. Exactly. And I It may trickle down to impeachment, you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely, because that you you saw almost every conservative Republican come out and say, this is horrifying, this is not what we believe. Now, in all fairness, Donald Trump campaigned on that issue, and I think the Republican base is not necessarily... He didn't campaign on abandoning our allies. He campaigned, he campaigned on, on a non bringing our troops home. Right, right. And, and not and precipitously. I mean, you can well, say... whatever. The, right. Ameri the American people, and the, well, the base of the Republican Party is much more isolationist than the leadership, and this is part of the reason they didn't like the establishment. Nevertheless, the establishment is furious, and I think rightfully so on this issue. And that may inform impeachment. This is the best, timing-wise, this is the best opportunity the Democrats have had to go after the president because of that. You're nodding in agreeing with her yet again. Do you, buy <laughs> that you agree with that? No, I think that, that this is a wedge. I also think that, you know, th there's an interesting question about whether Trump has to worry not only about being convicted in the Senate, but the impact of even a robust majority falling short of the two-thirds, but a robust majority on his ability to govern and on his election uh, chances. Two-thirds majority to remove him from That's office. Right. That's but right. Fair, I, I don't think that Thank will you. happen. I don't think the Republicans would ultimately vote to convict. Good to see you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for your time. Jennifer Viserys, Judge Nancy Gertner.